Hey friends, how you doing? Boy, I hope you guys are all having a great day. Well, I am tired, but this was moving day for mom. So we, uh, we had movers come and we moved from one room to another and I was trying to unpack as much as I could until I just flat out wore out. But that's okay. There'll be some more time before mom's ready to come home and I'll get a room ready for her by the time uh, she is she is going to return. So I hope you've all had a great week so far. It has been whew, busy, but I guess that's called life, isn't it? So yeah, so I am um, in Kansas City. I am sitting at the hotel tonight because well, that's just the way it is, and sometimes a girl needs to do that. So grab your Bibles. We are obviously uh, in Revelation, and I know I got a little excited when I was working through this. Um, you know, it, it, it amazes me. As many times as I've done these, I've done this study, how there's always something new that you go, ah, I hadn't even noticed that before. Yeah, and this was another one of those times that as I was studying it, I discovered that new, all those new things again. So grab your Bibles and we're going to wait about a minute and we'll see who who else comes on uh, with us. But uh, here in Kansas City, rain, well, hit parts of town but not all of it. But I had the coolest thing happen this morning when I was leaving my house at a 5.30 in the morning, or whatever it was, and I, it was raining, well, it, it drizzling kind of on me, but I, as I came towards Kansas City, I ran into rain, but I also had the most gorgeous, awesomeness rainbow, and it followed me. It was so cool. I had to stop and take pictures, of course, of it because it was and when I the the one picture that I have of the full rainbow I literally can see into the field where it came to the ground on and right in front of me where it touched the ground it was so cool and then as I was driving it kept following me so I knew God was with me and on my journey so it was pretty amazing I was so excited when I got into town that um, the rain never even bothered me then. So uh, let's pray and then we're going to get started. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for today, for our time together, for the time that you give us for rainbows, rain clouds, sunshine, crops growing, and friends who continue to support and love each of us and our families. We give you thanks. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, we are on Revelation 5, verse 9. So grab your Bible, and let's begin with reading there. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue and every nation. A new song. Man, you think about the music that there has to be in heaven, that there has to be in this other space. There has to be so much music so in a new song is being played out here. You know, it's music from the heart. It is that music that motivates us, that encourages us, lifts us. And that's what I was listening to music uh, uh, on the way in as well. And there is, but there's, five, there is a song that is anticipating this glorious redemption that God is about to begin for each of us. It's a new song about how worthy is Jesus in, to receive our adoration and the sound that we are redeemed 
by God. See, that's what's so important to remember, is that that is that, that it makes no difference who we are. We are the redeemed because of the blood of Jesus. Salvation is ours for those who will accept it, for those who will receive it, for those who will be. See, Jesus died for every one of us. I don't care who we are. I don't care, care what color skin we are. There are no barriers to the gift of salvation. It is free. We can choose to reject it. We can choose to accept it. That's what verse 9 is talking about. Look at verse 10. And has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Huh. Is this about us, do we think? That Christians will reign with Jesus for a thousand years? I think so. This is about us. We shall reign on earth. A promise is given that the multitude, which no man can number, will reign. Christians who have been saved will reign and rule during God's and Christ's thousand-year kingdom. Okay, this line, some of the tribulation language, we really, it, as, as Lutherans especially, don't get hung up on as much because we understand our salvation to be tied up into Christ and that we are one with him. We don't really get hung up onto some of that language. So I think for us, sometimes it's, it is difficult for us to wrap our heads around and realize we don't need to worry about it. That, that time period, it's a marker. It's not the end. We are part of a journey and we are on that journey together. Okay, verse 11. And I behold, or I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels around about the throne and the beasts and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands and thousands. In other words, there it is innumerable. There's too many to even count that many thousands and thousands that there is. It's really not a literal number for you and me to figure out. Okay, this is one of those times we have to accept the word play that's going on there. It just means there's a huge, huge number. It would be a, all of the spirit, ministering spirits and angels. The voice had to be so loud to be such a, in such a magnitude. Imagine how loud that voice was. It's huge and huger and hugest maybe. I know. See, I got myself all excited about this because I love it. Okay, verse 12. Saying with a loud voice, uh, the loud voice again, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Oh, can you hear it? Can you hear the majesty of the powerful? Can you hear it? Can you, oh, can you feel it? These words are the words that are intrinsic, the power, the riches, the wisdom, the strength, the honor, the glory, and the blessing. It is who God is to the Lamb and demands our praise. We should get louder as we say those words. You know, when we sing the communion chorus part, worthy is the lamb that was slain. This is part of and where it comes from in our liturgy. This is our communion liturgy. And we should sing it with total adoration and recognition of Jesus. It should be shouted 
to me, there's no silence about this. It's all about giving that all that glory to God. Verse 13. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Another affirmation that Jesus created everything and everyone. This takes us back to Genesis from the very beginning, from the trees and the fish, the birds, the living beings, the animals, the people, and all should cry out their blessings to God. Everything should be profound and loud. Hmm. Probably the word that would be better, maybe, instead of um, to him that sitteth about the, up on the throne, the him would have probably been Elohim God um, in Jewish, it would have, or in Hebrew. It, it probably is closer to being because uh, it's, it, it's, it, it's that majesticness. This is not a limited time of saying we are supposed to be praising God. My friends, this is about to re this is to reach into eternity from the beginning to the end, not just now for us, but for eternity. It's continual. It's the imperative that we go on and on. Not just for a little time on Sunday morning. Maybe not even for just that little time that we do our devotions. But it is how do we live our lives? Do we give praise and honor on a continual basis to all those things and places that we are? Or do we hold back and not Share God's blessing. Verse 14. And the four beasts said, Amen. Can you hear it? Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that lived forever and ever. Everyone fell prostrate. Everyone fell prostrate and praised him. The beasts the angels, everyone, and all of creation worships God in all fullness. This takes us back to Genesis, doesn't it? It takes us back to the beginning, to the beginning and to the end. These stories parallel each other. Okay, we're going to go on to chapter 6. This is probably, this is a really lengthy peer, uh, section because it really goes from um, verse starting now with 6 through 1921, this next section. It, it is about the time of tribulation. It's about the opening of the uh, first seal through the seventh seal, so all seven of them, the trumpet and the bowl judgment to the return of Christ to destroy the ungodly. A huge section. Now, there's going to be some images that we're going to go, oh, no, we don't like them. No, we don't like them. They make us uncomfortable. They make us uncomfortable because, one, we don't exactly know what, some of them even are, or what they mean. But I think they make us uncomfortable because it may actually speak to us and, and tell us more about the story we are and should be portraying. It's about, really, see, the seals in chapter 6 represent the beginning of Christ's judgment of unbelievers on the earth during that tribulation period, which, again, let's not get hung up on that. But this is about unbelief. 
we don't, I mean, the purpose of the tribulation period was to punish those unbelievers for their sin and rejection of Christ and bring them back to faith in Christ. I mean, it was really that time. Again, we don't want to get caught up here, okay? So we're going to kind of move through that part. Okay, so 6-1. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, come and see. Well, I had thunder today. Well, where I was, there was no rain. We just got a lot of thunder with it, but no rain. But I love the images. Of course, we know who the lamb is, right? The lamb is Christ. He is the only one worthy to open the seals. It is him who we are talking about. One of the four beasts, one of the four living creatures, said, come and see. Oh, I was going to look it up, and I forgot to. I'll look up something for next week. I want to, I want to see what the number is. And here, here it is. We know that all four Gospels have come and see in it, right? That those are words that we're familiar with. Come and see. Come and see what's going on. But see, this is about entering the heavenly stage. We are being moved from one place to another. We're going to see the opening of the first seal and the triumph of Christ and his church. But we can't do it here. We are being moved literally as we read it. Think about how that we are being transported. You may have to shut your eyes and make those images come through. Wow. Wow is what I say. Okay. The four, uh, we're going to get, start getting the pictures of the horsemen, yeah, begin with this is that part of this? No, it's in the next verse. Okay, so here we are. The lamb's going to open a seal. We've got thunder. Okay, again, uh, thunder, the loudness. And this is a little rumbling. I think this is profound thunder that just rolls. This is about, again, the majesty the glory, it is big and it is powerful. And God is present. Okay, so now we're going to, the next verse starts us into the horsemen. And the four horsemen in the apocalypse often get us kind of weirded out. This is about a picture of man's humanity, in, man's inhumanity to men. Okay, man's inhumanity to man. That's what I meant to say. It, it is about the suffering we have caused for and to each other. There, this isn't new. This isn't new stuff. This is stuff we do know, and we know happens. See, one of the things, too, about the tribulation is that the, there's going to be plagues. But if I remember right, back in Genesis, or in Exodus, we get the plagues as the Ten Commandments. Pharaoh is, it is, has plagues unleashed on him. This is nothing new. And there are those who will reject having their name written by the Lamb in the book of life. Verse 2. So the judgments are really started with the seven seals. Okay. So verse 2. And I saw and behold a white horse. Oh, we like the white horse, don't we? That's a pretty color. Kind of reminds us of maybe the unicorns. I'm not sure this is a unicorn horse. And he sat... 
and he that and and he that sat on him had a bow and a crown was given unto him and he wore, went forth conquering and to conquer okay this is kind of interesting i think because if you look at this the white horse of course what do you what do you think i think there's something interesting that comes out of this um that we also get the antichrist out of here and we're going to talk about that um this horseman's not the same as the one in the end which is Christ at his second coming. This is, he's the first. He is wearing white. He has a bow, but no arrows. He is militarily strong in the beginning, but his conquering is by diplomacy. Think about that. He does conquer. By diplomacy, though, not by an arrow. But he's wearing a crown that he was given, given the crown, because he was successful in his efforts. So, who would this be? Is it man? the Antichrist, who through deceit and clever maneuvering will bring false peace to the world, a peace that won't last. This was an interesting thought as I, as I worked through this. This is an animal that's that represents an unparalleled time of world peace. A false peace, though, that was short-lived. A peace that'll be ushered in by false messiahs, culminating with that Antichrist being present. Huh. He that sat on him. Look at that phrase. The four horses and the riders do not represent specific specific individuals but it's really about the forces okay so we're not going to put people on these horses it's about the forces that they bring um he's the antichrist is going to be a leading figure and john's point is 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 really is that the world becomes obsessed with pursuing this false peace False peace, not true peace in Christ. The bow, it's a symbol of war, but there's no arrows. So this victory is a bloodless one. Maybe a peace won by covenant and agreement, but not by war, at least blood war. The crown. Oh, since we're starting the Olympics, this would be a laurel wreath. And we think about those wreaths being put on and would have been in old olden times on the Olympians' heads. It was given to him. He will conquer the entire world, the entire earth, in a bloodless coup. Does this make us squirm a little bit? Does it make us think about what is going on? Oh, we know that the Bible talks about that two-edged sword, the law and gospel, and that the flesh and spirit are always in conflict with each other. That law and that gospel, the physical and the, uh, the spiritual and the flesh, Mm. Verses three and four, the sec are talking about the second seal. Brings war and a lack of peace. There's going to be a sword, so now we have armed conflict. 
is going to show up. So in verse 3, And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. Well, John really is, just like you and me, I think, wanting to come and see. We want to get a glimpse of what John is seeing. The problem is the next horse is red. And that red horse means war. Constant attack of the devil on you and me, on Christians around the world. And this is going to be a very large war that will be played out against you and me. Verse 4. And there went out another horse that was red. And power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth. And that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. Now remember... The one on the white horse, the power was about peace. Problem is, it was a false peace. This one is all about taking peace from the earth. That man should kill one another and was given a great sword to do it. Red, obviously, because the blood that would be shed The Holocaust of war, a worldwide war, a sign maybe of the birth pangs, the beginning pains of God's wrath being placed upon the world. Oh, some call it that we are entering that time. Some would say we are and that we're headed for World War III. And especially if we look in Daniel, we see there's three kings that oppose the Antichrist. And that's where I think the speculation is that there would be a World War III. I don't want to read more into it than is there. But I want us to think about it. I want you and me to think through what it means for us and in our time and our space. It's hard to think that when that they should kill one another, violent slaughter becomes commonplace. I guess today as I think about the shootings that happened just today, does it feel like we are entering that time? Could it be? Mankind is slaughtering one another. For, for in the, the Greek verb, would have meant to butcher, to slaughter, and massacre someone. Hmm. Is it feeling that way? And the sword. This is not a long, like the elegant sword. It's a short, short one that would be used as an assassination tool in revolts and massacres and slaughters. It would be a shorter weapon that would be more easily maneuvered for the assassins. If we look in Zechariah, Zechariah 1, And I turned and lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, there came four chariots, out from between two mountains, and the mountains were mountains of brass. The brass in this term in Zechariah would mean judgment. The four, that it's a universal message. It would be for all to hear. In Zechariah 6, verses 2 and 3, we hear... In the first chariot were red horses, and the second chariot black horses, and the third white, and the fourth grizzled or bay. It's kind of the same 
message. Zechariah warned us about. In Zechariah 6, 4, Then I answered and said unto the angel that talked with me, What are these, my Lord? And in 5, I'm going to come back to that in just a second. And the angel answered and said unto me, These are the four spirits of the heavens which go forth from standing before the Lord of all the earth. So the angel, what the angel meant there is that this is the answer he got. And we see the spirit of war in that red horse. Even in Zechariah, that same thing that we found in the second horse coming out of Revelation. You see why this is exciting? Do you see, though, the implications for you and me? The prayer of Revelation is to take the story of Jesus to those who are not believers and bring them into life the fullness of life that only Jesus can promise. For you and me, it's time. Oh, it's time for you and me to go about our business of being faith-filled and faithful tellers of the story. Well, my friends, our time has come to an end again. It always goes so fast. And I always get more prepared and I get so excited. I want to talk about more. But it's time to go. My friends, my prayers are with you this week. I ask and I ask for God to continue to guide you and strengthen you. Let him bless you. But shout, worthy and holy is his name. That he may go forth with you to share and give hope. And bring back to the fold those who are not believers. Oh, my friends, I hope to see you Sunday at 10 o'clock. And, of course, back here on Monday at 7 o'clock for Genesis. God, walk with you, walk beside you, behind you, above you, and below you. May he hold you as you go about your week that you may be blessed and a blessing to others. Good night, my friends. Have a great evening.